Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the IMF's debate on the global economy. I'm Sarah Eisen from CNBC's Closing Bell. Coming to you from the New York Stock Exchange, I'm thrilled to be doing this panel again. We are here to discuss the issues that are impacting the global economy, everything from the COVID-19 pandemic to inflation. And we have got the all-star panel here today. So let's, let's dive right in. I want to welcome to the conversation, as always, the IMF Managing Director, Kristalina Gorgieva. Kristen Hi, Forbes Sarah. from... Hi, good to see you. Sorry it can't be in person, although you told us last time it would be. I know you're. I know it's coming back a little bit. Yeah. Fingers crossed for April. Uh, Christian Forbes is also here from MIT Sloan School of Management. <laughs> Dr. Mo Ibrahim from the Mo Ibrahim Foundation and Chairman of the National Institute of Financial Research at Tsinghua University, Dr. Min Zhu. It's an honor for me to be here with such an esteemed panel of guests. Let's dive right in. Madam MD, set the stage for us. You, you just downgraded the global economy at the IMF to a still pretty healthy 5.9 percent growth rate this year. Next year, a slight slowdown to 4.9 percent again, still pretty solid. So how is the outlook changing in your view? Well, the uh, downgrade uh, for this year is really tiny. And we have to recognize we are on the path to recovery. But this is not the whole uh, story, Sarah. Uh, the recovery is hobbled. I actually talk about it as walking with stones in your shoes. There is more uncertainty today than we had a couple of months ago. There is some loss of momentum in the US, in China, although they are recovering uh, quite impressively. And most importantly, we are now seeing three problems looming bigger than they did uh, in, in, in the previous forecast. Number one, divergence we warned about is becoming more persistent. Number two, inflation, we think it is transitory, but is mm -hmm. creating much more anxiety and more focus of policymakers. And three debt levels have gone up, understandably. We needed to support households and businesses when the economy was on standstill. But we are coming close, closer and closer to the time when debt needs to be serviced. And in that context, we are looking into a very critical action we need to take if we don't want these problems to deepen in the future. <laughs> well, Kristen, let me ask you, because the U.S. Was, was one of the growth engines for this remarkably fast comeback that we have seen in the global economy. But now we're at a point where fiscal stimulus is fading, monetary stimulus is about to get pared back. Where does that leave us for, for the rest of the year and into next? Yeah. So let me build on what Kristalina said. There's this great quote uh, economists like to use when they talk about recessions and recoveries. Recessions usually occur with the speed of an elevator going down, but the recovery is the speed of an escalator coming back up. So quick downdraft and then a very slow recovery. But this recession and recovery is very different and it was a very quick collapse, but the recovery has also been very quick. So it's almost like this cycle, we've gone down by the elevator and up by the elevator also. But that elevator up hasn't gotten us all the way there. We still have more room to recover. There's still workers out of the labor force who haven't come back. And that gets at this broader nature of this recovery is it's very uneven. You have some companies doing extremely well. They can't meet demand. They can't hire enough workers. They're raising prices. You have other companies still struggling. You go downtown and you see stores still shuttered and not open. Um, it's very uneven in terms of individuals. Some individuals are doing great working from home, uh, working from a second home. The value of their assets have gone up uh, and they're doing just fine. And then there's other people who have health issues are still struggling to get back into work. Um, and then companies, there's a big unevenness. Some companies are recovering. They'll close the gap from before COVID by the end of this year and others have a long ways to go. So that's the challenge. It's in the U.S. It's in countries around the world. Super fast recovery. So inflation is picking up. Prices are picking up. But we're not all the way there. And it's a very uneven rate of recovery amongst different companies, amongst different individuals. So that makes it very challenging for policymakers. How do you support those who still need to be support, but yet cut back on stimulus because of the unusual pace of the recovery so far? 
Are we still going to see five, six percent growth rates, or is that is that over, Kristen, in the U.S.? I, I think we still got another good year as long as policymakers sort of do the right thing and keep some support, but withdraw some so inflation doesn't um, become too persistent. Uh, but it's hard to imagine you've got another year of five to six percent growth, especially even for the global economy. Mo, I, we saw you smiling during Kristen's answer. Maybe, maybe the have and the have nots is something that, that resonates with you which would love to get your take on, on the recovery that we are seeing in sub-Saharan Africa. But, you know, the vaccine access is so critical and so challenged over there, which we'll get into. But just an overview of, of how you see the recovery playing out there. Well, I'll, I'll start from uh, Christine's uh, analogy there. Uh, African countries went down a very fast elevator. But we are not going up uh, with escalator. We are going up the stairs. And uh, slowly, slowly, and every now and then we stop to catch our breath. There is a major difference, really, between what is happened in the rich countries and what's happening in the poor countries, in, particularly in Africa. Uh, you sent your people home, lock them up, and say, don't worry. We're going to send you a check every month, and, and you'll be fine. Our leaders sent people home, but they did not send us any checks or anything. And uh, many of our people earn their living day by day. So the suffering really economically, I think, was more severe than the health hit by, by, by the pandemic. But understandably, I mean, we don't have the fiscal space. Uh, rich countries spent about $11 trillion dollars to deal with this. African countries have no physical space uh, to, to spend. They cannot even borrow uh, 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 at reasonable terms. So it is a major problem is still uh, uh, playing out in Africa. And then there's China, Min, which was also very fast to recover and very, very strongly recovered. And then we had these, these rolling COVID outbreaks, which shut down parts of the economy. And now there's this massive debt bomb known as Evergrande. So wh where does that leave the outlook for the, your country? Well, well, overall, I think that China have a strong growth, roughly 8% by IMF estimations. And I think inflation is still very moderate. And the financial actually quite stable. Yes, Evergrande, the debt issues really cause the concern. But I think it still is the one company is really isolated, it's manageable, and now currently it's very much a use the market approach, less the company to discuss and negotiate with the creditors. And they still have a room to manage it, so government try to sort of coordinate it with both sides. I don't think it will create any systemic risk. I think the issue can be solved. And overall, and the financial stability is there, and the growth is quite strong. Do you think that the, the Chinese government is going to step in to make sure that there is no systemic risk from Evergrande and other property developers? Well, that's a good point. The tricky thing is whether, whether we see systemic risk or not. So far, at this moment, I don't think we see any systemic ri risk. This is a company, they have a few death issues, and uh, uh, the companies try to work hard. They have a space within the company, right? And uh, I, the market also see uh, they probably won't be able to go through. Uh, but whether it depends, if we really get into sort of blowout in a big way, getting into systemic impact, I, I'm sure the market will step in, uh, the government will step in. Madam Managing Director, wanted to bring it back to the vaccine conversation, which, which I know you're very focused on and is so tied to the fate of, of these economies. So enough vaccines have been given to vaccinate more than 40 percent of the global economy, and yet it's not happening equally. 40 percent of, of the global population, I should say, 20 times more likely to get vaccinated in a high-income country than a low-income mm -hmm. country. So how do we fix that? Yeah, well, uh, to use Christine's analogy, I think it is great. We have the elevator countries, we have the escalator countries, and we have the stair countries, and the stairs are really... <laughs> steep. Whether we talk about vaccinations with advanced economies, some emerging markets uh, now 
coming to 70% with at least one dose. And then we have the uh, uh, countries that are in the middle where vaccinations are likely to get to 40% by the end of this year. And then we have the low-income countries where we are struggling. Now, here is our dilemma. We have enough doses to vaccinate everybody or rather to reach the 40% target in every country. What we don't have is the delivery that goes where the needs are, are most severe. And we do not have an ability to swap delivery dates, to have schedules that fit the needs of the world. So if you are, if you are an elevated country and you have delivery in October and you don't really need it so much, why not swap with the stair country and then get vaccines to go there with priority? And you put on top of this vaccination divide the fiscal space. Elevator countries, 28% to GDP support for their economies and their people. Escalator countries, 6%. The stair countries, less than 2%. Those two things combined are the drivers of this divergence. And now, why should you care, uh, Sarah, living in the United States? You should care very deeply for two reasons. One, because if we don't vaccinate everybody everywhere, we're More leaving variants. space for new variants. And we know what the Delta has done to the U.S., Secondly, because when one part of the world is falling behind, interruptions in production there are quite severe. That affects global value chains. What does that do? Demand goes up in the escalator countries. They're recovering fast, but supply is not catching up. And we see that reflected in prices going with the Elevator or with the escalator? <laughs> we can discuss that, but price is going <laughs> up. In other words, it puts pressure on inflation. So nobody's safe until everybody's safe. Just, just very quick follow-up, Madam MD. Would you support, so then do you support the WHO's position that the elevator countries should not be giving boosters to their population until shots are given more widespread mm -hmm. to, to the global economy, to places like Africa? Uh, our analysis shows that production capacity is sufficient to deliver doses for those that are not vaccinated and also to uh, provide for booster shots, especially for uh, elderly people, people with weak uh, mm -hmm. immune systems. We actually believe very strongly that the bigger problem is in ability to deliver vaccines to the countries that need it. In other words, to have transparent contracts and transparent delivery schedules and to have in these countries health systems that can take, a veil, can take the vaccine and turn it into a shot in the arm. So these two problems are more severe than production capacity per se. There is also a financial angle if we are to be... Uh, completely honest, we see still a gap of about $20 billion in grant money to help with this last mile, to get the shot mm -hmm. in the arm, uh, but also to provide other very, very needed elements of the pandemic response, like therapeutics, like masks, uh, like hydrogen, so people don't die unnecessarily just because of lack of money. Mo, I, I know you, you have to have an opinion here. T tell us how bad it is in terms of the vaccination rates across Africa and, uh, and what you think needs to be done. Right. I, I think it's a terrible statement about global uh, leadership, uh, or rather the lack of it. Uh, we have seen G7, G20 meetings, etc., cetera, uh, ending up really being more just a photo opportunity than... than uh, taking any action. Uh, it is a problem. And the problem should be framed not in the 
just lack of solidarity, which is clear. Uh, uh, but actually, misunderstanding even of, of self-interest. Yes. As Caritalina said, you know, uh, all those politicians, they know that be, their people cannot be safe <laughs> until everybody is safe. And everybody, we all heard this from every politician. What, what they have done to do it? None. And what we saw actually is a bizarre race uh, between various leaders in rich countries to say, okay, I vaccinated my people faster than you. Uh, every Look, I, I, I'm going to be frank here. I'm, I'm unemployed, so nobody can dismiss Please. me. Okay. I mean, look, unfortunately, we don't have many statesmen or stateswomen at the moment. We really have politicians. And the main interest of our political leadership is the next election. What are they do to the next election? And it's clear what you want to do. I want to, I'm not going to increase taxes for, for uh, 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 you know, to deal with, I'm sorry about this, to deal with uh, uh, carbon or uh, uh, 12. My intention now is really to, to vaccinate as much of my people to show that I'm better than the other leaders. And that is really very sad. So I, I, I'm, I'm really in despair, and I'm sorry, my phone is ringing, and I don't know why anybody <laughs> wants to call me now. <coughs> I, I, I do apologize about this. But let us be frank. I, we don't see really leadership around us. And it is for the interest <coughs> of their own people. And that's how, how the argument should be framed, not on basis of a charity or... or so. I wish to see more. And you know what, Sarah? This boat's really bad because we have another big fight looming. We have a perfect storm. We have the pandemic and we are not out of the woods yet. And now we all realize we have very little time to deal with, to deal with climate change. Both of them need serious commitment and serious leadership, which we don't see, frankly. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm rather pessimistic, really, about our future as a human race. Kristalina, did you, did you want to respond to that? You have your work I, cut out for you I just wanted to say, not because I'm employed, but I'm slightly more optimistic because we have seen over the last month, month and a half, that there is more mobilization to vaccinate the world. And we know that part of this is exactly what Mo is talking about, enlightened self-interest. We are going to lose $5.3 trillion over the next five years if we don't bridge the, the, the divergence in the recovery. And vaccination is the number one factor to do it. And I also believe, Mo, that leaders are starting to feel pressure from their own populations. Because if this is a yo-yo recovery, we open, we close, we start going uh, together in meetings, then we, we stop. That is not necessarily impressing citizens in countries. Mm. And uh, that sense of, OK, you can do better, uh, mm. is going to help. The, the problem, climate Christina, crisis, they, they are not, the sm they are not crisis smart mode. enough to see that. Yeah, well, that's the problem. I, I, I think, I think uh, we see the dosages have gone up, vaccination rates ha have accelerated, not as much as necessary, but a little bit of this is happening. Well, I, I just of the eleven forward. of the oh, uh, ahead, uh, excuse me, Sarah, <laughs> of the eleven trillion dollars those guys spent over the last year, less than one percent would have vaccinated the whole world. So. Kristen, I want, I want to get to you. But, but I, also, I also sort of want to add a new element, which is in a country like ours, it's, it's an, it's, in a way it's even sadder because we only have just over 50% of our population double vaccinated in a country where we don't have an access problem or a spending problem, and we were the first to come up with the vaccines. So does that represent an economic headwind for this country? Yeah. And, and 
Why yeah, that gets sure. at exactly the point I wanted to make, linking to the comments that were just made, is if we want to recover, if we want to get incomes back to where they were before and make up the lost ground, the only way to do that is to get vaccines out and get populations vaccinated, whether that's countries. I think some of the statistics in the IMF's latest report that less than 5% of populations in some low-income countries are vaccinated, that obviously needs to go up. Um, in advanced economies like the U.S., we still have to vaccinate more people. The only way to get that elevator back up to where it started, back to my initial analogy, is going to be to get vaccines out there. Um, the IMF has a pretty striking graph in one of the reports they just issued, which shows that key to how quickly countries are recovering and closing their output gaps. It's not even how many COVID cases they have. It's not as much the policies. It's how many vaccines you've got. Mm -hmm. So that this the, the issues around vaccination directly links to the economic challenge of getting economies to recover. That is the linchpin. Mm -hmm. men, men, and you know, you know, Christian, one of one of the sad things is that. Some vaccines now is starting to expire on the shelves of some of the rich country because of the reluctance of citizens to take it. Is it not sad for a vaccine to expire when people mm -hmm. out there are suffering? Is it not ridiculous? It's very ridiculous, I think. Yeah. I would agree. No, a, yes. Uh, uh, that's yeah, one we a, don't have to debate. Min, Min, how's <laughs> it going in China? Are, are the Chinese vaccines working? And, and how, how, much, how much are they providing? access to the rest of the world. Yeah, I think vaccination is the key, as uh, Madam Managing Director mentioned, for the global economy for end of this year and for next year as well. Um, the statistics in the U.S. made this very clear. A state with a higher vaccination ratio, the growth has been stronger, right? I mean, if, even within the U.S., you can see a clear, clear picture. And uh, in China, we're very serious about this here with the COVID-19, about the vaccinations. And the vaccination ratio is now, I mean, double shot across more than 50%, uh, so one shot across 70%. But also China's doing its own bit, donate the vaccines to the other countries and also uh, uh, spare uh, the manufacturing capacity with other countries as well. But the whole thing is really the global leadership. I think the, the mathematics is very simple, right? The $20 billion to save roughly, as the managing director mentioned, $5.3 trillion for the next five years. It's so clear. We just need the political leader getting together, agree, for example, use new SDI, and put them out as roughly $20 billion, and uh, then we'll get things done. So mm -hmm. IMF has a lot of things to do. I also want to hit inflation because that's another big risk to, to the outlook and was mentioned all over the world economic outlook from the IMF. And you, you guys all feel it in, in different parts of the world. Kristen, how big, of a, how big of a headwind do you see inflation right now for the U.S.? We talk about it every single day because every single company that reports earnings or pre-announces is saying that, it, that they're feeling it, it, whether it's supply chain constraints, labor shortages, all adding up to consumers paying higher prices. You know, it is striking how the debate has changed in a year. Just a year ago, we were worried about inflation always being too low. And could you ever get inflation back to targets? And now we're worried about the exact opposite. So I think on one level, we should all breathe a sigh of relief. We don't need to worry about deflation anymore in the cycles we've been in the last few years in advanced economies. And we know what to do when inflation picks up. You do have the tools in advanced economies. You know, In the U.S., if inflation... Uh, inflationary pressures are persistent for longer than people are expecting. We know what to do about that. It'll involve raising rates. That will involve another set of risks. And I think that's one of the biggest vulnerabilities going forward is the world needs to get ready for a potentially faster series of rate hikes than a lot of people are expecting. Um, but we, if inflation is the biggest concern, you do know how to deal with it. It's just then the side effects of dealing it, with it that I think are the biggest ris risk and issue out there. Wait, Chris, Delina, didn't, didn't you warn central bankers not to move too soon with rate hikes when it comes to fighting this inflation? What we are saying is that um, as long as we vaccinate the world and we move to a place where even we still have residual COVID, it is not holding back sectors and economies, it will be transitory. But we have to watch it. And in the uh, report we just published, we are saying be vigilant. Why we are saying that? 
we are saying it because we may be faced with a new phenomenon and we are searching for a term for it. Is it growthflation when some countries are and sectors are growing uh, fast, but others are falling behind, interrupting supply chains and creating this pressure on prices? Is it because we have generated so much savings at the time when the economy was on standstill? In any case, our message is for advanced economies, very likely by mid next year, we are going to see inflation receding, again, provided we wrestle with the pandemic more aggressively. But in many emerging markets and developing countries, inflation is already a problem and central bank banks are already raising interest rates to deal with it. So what is to watch? Are inflation expectations de-anchoring? And... Uh, then take, take uh, necessary measures. Uh, we talk a lot about supply chain, but we also need to add to that other factors for interruptions like climate events. What we are seeing, for example, for food prices, they're being pushed up by 30%. And imagine in poor countries, poor families, what it means for them. And what is, where is the push up coming from? Multiple sources. Energy prices up, interruptions due to uh, weather events hurting agricultural productivity, transportation costs, we see that being a big factor today. All of this piling up and pushing prices uh, in a way that does cause us definitely a pause for poor countries, for, for emerging markets, and it has to be watched carefully. Uh, in advanced economies, because imagine what it would be if the Fed in the United States was to have to respond to inflation expectations, the anchoring. How would that translate into pressure on interest rates in emerging markets with high debt levels that are not yet growing the way the United States is? Could be a nightmare. Min, curious your take here. Is this, is this a transitory phenomenon and what does that even mean? Exactly. That's the key issue. I think when we talk about inflation, the key was is a transitory. I see the drives for inflation escalating is a non transitory, right? For example, the structure change. For example, the climate change related energy mm -hmm. structure changes, commodity price changes, labor market constraints, right? And uh, all the things are non-transitory. So I don't see the inflation as a transitory. I think the inflation is really on the way up. We got to be very careful about that because it is for the whole world, particularly it's important for emerging market, low-income country when Fed changes policies on the, uh, the, the interest rates and the capital flow moves. We observe that happens in 2013. Uh, so the transitory is really the key issues. I think the view is very much divided. But from my, what my view I can see is even in China, the CPI is relatively moderate, but PPR increase very strong, mm -hmm. reflect the very high price on the commodities, on the energy price, and on the shipping costs, and on the supply disruption as well. Kristen? I wanted to jump in here on this. Raphael Bostic, the president of the Atlanta Fed, gave a really nice speech yesterday on this transitory yeah. de debate. And he made this he hates that point. word. Well, yeah, when you hate that word, don't use it anymore. He suggests using episodic, which I think makes sense. Because if you look up transitory, he claims, there's two definitions. One is of short duration, um, and the other yeah. is temporary. And the economists can use that. They can mean very different things. Short duration, this is not going to be a short duration spike mm -hmm. in inflation. This is going to last longer exactly. than people had expected. But it may still be temporary, just not mm -hmm. short duration. And that's where the term transitory gets confusing. So I think episodic captures that better. Um, but my overall take is a lot of the price pressures right now, they will be longer lasting, but they should be temporary if met with the right policy responses based on the country. Mm -hmm. For yep. some countries, that means they can sit it out. If they have well-managed inflation expectations, don't have a history of high inflation, they probably could wait it out. 
and not act aggressively. Other countries where they have a history mm -hmm. of high inflation do need to act more aggressively. And that gets at Kristalina, one of, I thought one of your key messages, which you didn't use the word this time around, but is so important, was calibrate, the yep. importance of calibrating policy. Um, we yep. don't know how quickly the supply side will recover. We don't know if this high inflation today will start to feed into wages and prices and inflation expectations. So we really need to sort of feel it out and every policymaker will have to adjust course. So for me, the most important thing is just being flexible. Don't announce ahead what you're gonna do over the next year. Um, central banks, fiscal policy needs to wait and see how the virus evolves, what happens with inflation, what happens with growth and be ready to calibrate. Uh, based on your country. Yep. But do you think, Kristen, the Fed is going to raise rates multiple times next year? <laughs> well, first, they've got a taper. <laughs> I, my, my personal take yep. is they've been a little slow at getting that going. Uh, the economy's bounced back pretty quickly. I worry about asset prices heating up too much. Um, I wish they'd gotten the tapering process going earlier. I think they do need to finish that before they start to talk about raising rates. Um, I think there is a scenario they might need to have that discussion next year. Um, but first, they've got to get tapering uh, in process. Should start in a few weeks if everything's on track. Mo, the, 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 another problem for, for Africa, soaring food prices and, and a potential tightening here from the world's largest central bank. What does that look like? Well, it is, it is a problem for us, to be honest. And uh, one thing actually we're looking for to stimulate our economies uh, was the uh, issue of SDR and recycling uh, some of the uh, uh, SDR. The SDR actually is what, $650 billion. Mm -hmm. The share of Africans is about $33 billion, is, is less than 5%, uh, which is ridiculous. The guys who, who spend $11 trillion are actually taking more of this $650 billion, which is the only, I mean, uh, Africa. Our share of this is the only source of cheap finance for our economies. So we have been talking about recycling, and uh, countries are still dragging their feet. I know Kristalina uh, is hopeful uh, to try to convince the shareholders to, to recycle maybe 100 billion. And uh, I don't know, maybe you tell us, Kristalina, where are you with this? I mean, those guys are dragging feet. Their feet. I heard only U.S. and France are doing something. Uh, is that true? What is, what is the picture? I'm so glad you asked. We just finished our committee meeting, the IMFC, and uh, I have news to share. We got very strong support for on lending, or as you as you called it, recycling of SDRs exactly for the reason you described. We have issued $650 billion equivalent, but low-income countries, vulnerable middle-income countries are getting a very small portion of it. So our proposal to the membership is countries in strong positions voluntarily can own land some of their SDRs, and the target is 100 billion dollars equivalent. Where we are is already quite a number of countries have announced they will do it. They have even given percentages how much they're going to pass through. We have two avenues. One is, we call it poverty reduction and growth trust. It is for low-income countries, zero interest rate, genuinely high concessional financing. And the news of the day, uh, Mo, is that we are going to create resilience and sustainability trust that will be for low-income and vulnerable middle-income countries. Uh, my aspiration is to see it in action as soon as possible. And then we would have one more instrument at the IMF for longer term concessional financing. And it would help not only with a crisis like this one, but also with the transformation of economies. Uh, since Christine uh, uh, brought up Calibrate, uh, the messages from this meeting in terms of what needs to be done are vaccinate, calibrate, 
but also accelerate, accelerate the transformation of economies to low carbon, climate resilient, digital inclusive path. This is wonderful, but can you share with us some of the numbers uh, Where what is the I, beef? I, just what I can say is that what I can say is that um, a couple of countries have announced that they would go in the direction of France, which is 20 yeah. percent. Uh, we have we had uh, a number of countries saying today we are not going to announce, but we have high ambition. Uh, and uh, when I took my calculator and I said, OK, let's see where we are going to land. The 100 billion uh, numbers, number is very, very achievable. Uh, my uh, more important message is that willingness of the membership to equip the fund with a longer term maturity instrument because of what is necessary to bring transmor transformative policies in emerging markets mm -hmm. and developing countries, in, in middle-income and uh, low-income countries. Why does that matter? Because if advanced economies invest in green growth, in smart growth, and developing economies don't, we would have one more line of division in our world that is going to do exactly what lack of vaccination is doing for the pandemic. Advanced economies reduce carbon emissions, but the rest of the world doesn't. So, I, uh, Mo, I am celebrating. I, I think tonight <laughs> I am going to I'm have a glass, a glass of wine. wine too. Okay, thank you. But I'm, I'm, glad you brought, I'm glad you brought up the point because, you know, one, one question I was going to ask a number of you was, was the role of the IMF and international coordination right now? And, and Min, maybe I'll turn it to you. And whether, you know, this, this question comes up a lot, but whether there is a challenge set up from countries like China uh, and some of the other emerging markets countries against institutions like the IMF and, and whether that, that represents a challenge for the fund, but also for the global economy uh, and just another layer of friction between U.S. and Europe and China. Well, the fund used to, to be a crisis manager, right, and uh, provide a short liquidity funds to the countries in trouble. But I think the, the, the global situation changes quite a lot, as the managing director mentions, right? We're facing more long-term, more global issues. So we need a quick response, but also we need long-term uh, concessional financing for low-income countries and the emerging market as well. And I'm so happy I heard uh, the fund is going to build an IST and also long-term concessional financing instruments. I think this is really fantastic. If we can get $100 billion for, for all those things, I think it will help emerging market low income country in big deal. And the only things I, I hope that all the country can move quickly and get this $100 billion in the package and can quickly move into the low-income country and uh, emerging market as well. It's not really a fair question, Kristalina, because everybody here on this panel is very much an IMF person and supporter <laughs> and has either worked at the IMF or, or is on board with the IMF. But, but I do wonder how you think about the question, especially in light of, and we don't need to re-adjudicate everything that's happened uh, lately, but, but with some of the accusations that you face lately about bias towards China at the World Bank and, and what the future of these institutions is in a world that is polarized and there is this power struggle between the U.S. and China. Well, let me first say cleared. <laughs> My board, yes. the board of the IMF, <laughs> looked at the evidence here and there and concluded there was no there there. Uh, but the more important point is how do we keep the membership together? And uh, today, during the meeting of the IMFC, the membership was so clearly together, focusing on these very big challenges we are wrestling with, immediate challenges and those that are further down on the horizon but are so significant. Uh, what is fantastic about the IMF? 190 members, big and small, rich and poor, and we have created this culture of engagement that is really one to focus on 
issues. And the uh, tone in the room, the uh, soberness with which we discussed uh, the pressing issues of today and tomorrow, the very simple conclusion that policymakers today are faced with the most complex, immediate and long-term challenges and the most difficult trade-offs. And they need to work together. They need to learn from each other. Otherwise, uh, we are all going to be worse off. Yeah, if so, I may, I, I would like to add one point. I think IMF chapter made it very clear. The share of uh, institutes have, have to be located by the size of a country's uh, 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 economies, right? So mm -hmm. with that, I think the global share really changed in a quite a dramatic way in the past 20, 30 years. And then China, for example, become the second largest economy, but still China is the third uh, largest shareholder of IMF. So the governance structure reform, I mean, is, is just to have to happen to follow the real world change. I think it's the same thing. Uh, the first part I say, the IMF is changing its function, its role to follow the change in nature of the global economic and the global stability issues, move into the IST and the long-term concession loan. I think it's fantastic. But also on the governance structures, we have to move together. In that sense, U.S. and China and the Europeans all have to work together, make sure the credential of international institutes. So if we just have a few minutes left, and I always, you know, we spend a lot of this time talking about the global economy, talking about the risks and the threats and, and what keeps you up at night, and that usually makes the headlines anyway. But I, I would love to end from, uh, with a comment from each of you on something that makes you optimistic. Uh, or, or that you're excited for of what's happening in, in the coming year, whether it's William Shatner going to space at age 90 or, or whatever it is. Um, so, so Christian, Kristen, let's let's start with you, and and we'll hold you to some of these predictions or optimistic views. Okay. Uh, first, I'll say what uh, one positive about what's happened over the last year. It's obviously been a horrific year and a half. Uh, but if you looked at what we were talking about last year at the bank fund meetings in October, mm -hmm. uh, there was so much uncertainty. We didn't know if there would be a vaccine. We didn't know if there would be a sharp recovery. And it really is remarkable, given the extent of the shutdown in the global economy, you know, governments, people telling people, stay home, shut your business, don't go to work, how at least in parts of the world, um, things have come back much faster than we would have been expecting a year, year and a half ago. And that's a combination of rapid policy, massive, unprecedented policy support, um, plus technology and the ability to find vaccines. So we now do have a path, even though some countries are lagging behind, it's going to be a lot slower recovery you know, up the stairs, not even talking about an elevator. Um, there is a path and we do have vaccines. We do have a path forward. And in many countries, there was a policy support to help people while we found that path and found the vaccine. So, you know, still huge challenges, but it could have been a lot, lot worse. And we wouldn't have a path out if we hadn't had technology. And that's where I get into the positive looking forward, um, reflecting MIT, you know, the school behind me, is the power of technology is where I have a lot of optimism. We saw the power of technology to come up with vac vaccines at an unprecedented pace, crank them out, not fast enough, but much faster than most people would have expected. We're seeing companies rethink how work is done now. You may not all need to be crowded in an office in a big city. We're seeing companies come up with all sorts of ways to use technology to be more efficient and hopefully get costs down in the future. So I think it's an incredibly exciting time of technological change. And that's what I'm optimistic about is this pandemic will accelerate the change and force companies to adopt some of the new technologies, use the internet, use the web, use these technologies at a much faster pace because they're being forced to reorganize right now. Mm -hmm. Mo, what about you? Uh, I'm really concerned about uh, our global cooperation and global governance. Uh, at a time when we are faced a number of global challenges, whether the pandemic or the the, the, the uh, climate challenge, uh, we really need more than ever global cooperation because no single country can deal with this issue. And there's no vaccine against global change. Uh, but what we're seeing is the stress in the global uh, 
institution, global system, the, the lack of cooperation, the emergence of two um, This was supposed to be something optimistic, Mo. Uh, Mo, no, if I this is the most realistic. optimistic you can do, I don't want to know you're pessimistic. Uh, no, but look, guys, I, I'm not pessimistic. I'm not optimistic about, about what's going on because I'm really worried. In Africa, we say something uh, very important proverb. I think very good, applicable here. When elephants fight, the the the, the grass get trampled, and mm. we are at that kind of moment actually. So let's just be careful. I know this is not cheerful, but it, it's really fair, realistic. Fair. Let's, 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 let's just come together and mm -hmm. find a way to work together to deal with these international challenges. I hope so. I'm sorry for being such sour and, and dour member of the panel. I'm sorry. No, we appreciate the <laughs> candor. Min, Min, what about you? I think the, the climate changes really bring a lot of optim optimism. To, to us, to everyone. I mean, I agree with uh, Christina. In China, the carbon neutrality commitment in 2060 is a really, really big deal. I think I can see it will push the Chinese economic system reform. It will change the technology innovation. It will make a scar clear. And it will change the people's consumption behavior as well. So it is really a paradigm shift in a China's development model. So that's give me a lot of, a lot of optimism and also bring the international cooperation. Right. I think this is fantastic. I think that all of us five years ago can, in Paris, we can never ever imagine in five years, we have more than 130 countries signed up for a climate change deal. Mm -hmm. So that's really good. Hmm. Cristalina, I know you to be a very optimistic person. I am. We just got 136 countries to agree on a global tax deal after 10 years of wrestling with it. Uh, what makes me optimistic is that we are starting to draw the lessons from this crisis. After the global financial crisis, we built a more resilient banking sector and it has paid back in this crisis. Now what we recognize is that the concept of resilience has to be much more comprehensive. We need resilient people, educated, healthy, with good social protection. We need a resilient planet, and there is a momentum uh, that wasn't there uh, before. And we need to have resilient institutions that make economies more able to withstand shocks. The same way people with strong immune system withstand COVID, countries with st strong institutions, with vibrant economies, high level of competition, transparency, they withstand economic shocks much better. So I, I, I expect to see us taking more that concept of resilience in a fast-moving, shock-prone world to heart. Uh, and perhaps I would finish with, remember be before the pandemic, we used to say the future is digital. With the pandemic, the future has arrived, and we are adapting to it. Uh, hopefully, rip off the benefits, manage well the risks of this uh, digital presence. And that, and that digital presence allowed us all to be here together. And, and I thank you all, because we are out of time for doing it. Next time in person. Th this time, I'm serious. Yes. Crystalina. We do. Uh, we do. We do. Thank you. God willing. Thank you all to the panelists. Thank Thanks for watching Thank as well. It was a great discussion. And I am honored to have joined you for it. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.